Mr. Speaker, I rise in expressing my unequivocal support for this amendment to our Constitution permitting the entrance of the CCG as our ultimate appellate court. Before my relatively brief contribution, Mr. Speaker, one which I have committed surgery on, I want to be mindful of not diluting what was an incisive, well-informed, extremely elucidating contribution made from the member, made by the member from Viewford South. Today marks, Mr. Speaker, an extremely historic moment as it sees only the second amendment to our 44-year-old constitution. As I usually do, Mr. Speaker, I feel the pulse of our people, listen to their concerns on any issue, and seek to either ensure that their concerns are put to rest, or where necessary, amplify those concerns. I could not help but, have a, but access social media, and more particularly, Mr. Speaker, the Facebook page of the Leader of the Opposition, a page which I believe must be considered to be the repository of blatant lies, calculated untruths, and a masterpiece in relation to a manifested intention of attempting to fool our people. But you know, Mr. Speaker, the well-known adage keeps springing to mind, as you can fool the people once or twice, but you cannot keep fooling all the people all the time. It was that very effort, Mr. Speaker, which worked some time ago, where a march for a non-existent $6.80 on every gallon of gas was the focus. Having won the elections and served the longest period as a term in the history of this country, up to now, up to now, that $6.80 remains a myth. <laughs> it never existed. I watch a handful of UWP supporters, Mr. Speaker, chanting no referendum, no CCG, and it bothered me. It really did. Why? Because I liken the situation to that of a starving individual. An individual is starving. You bring him or her a healthy meal. But because he or she cannot identify that meal and equate it to what an impoverished meal ought to be and what they've grown accustomed to, they throw away your healthy meal, not appreciating it at all. And guess what? They remain in starvation. The starving individual simply does not know better. The handful of UWP supporters, Mr. Speaker, as I saw this morning outside this August chamber, simply do not know better. When he speaks, they listen without applying their own analytical ability to what is being said. Now you know, Mr. Speaker, when they chant no referendum, no CCG, I looked at them. I looked at them in total amazement because one of the utterances of Jesus Christ came to mind. Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. In this instance, I would say, Father, forgive them because they know not what they say. Ask them what's the CCG. Ask them what is the Privy Council. Ask them what are we doing. It is just that, Mr. Speaker, 
persons find an opportunity to parade on the altar of political loyalty. If you ask them what are the advantages and disadvantages, they cannot even engage you in any meaningful discourse. All they know what to do, Mr. Speaker, is to match. So, Mr. Speaker, that, in my view, epitomizes what heightened stupidity is all about. And it is defined, a referendum is defined as a vote by the electorate on an issue. That's basically what a referendum is. A vote by the electorate on an issue. The biggest and most meaningful, most engaging referendum any country could have is a general election. So there was indeed a referendum on July 26, 2021, and the people voted overwhelmingly. Not only, Mr. Speaker, that they voted to remove the most corrupt government of all times, but they also voted based on the undertakings that this government had given them through its manifesto. And it spoke loudly and clearly of a manifested intention to replace our highest appellate court, which up to this point remains the Privy Council with the CCG. So the question, Mr. Speaker, is who is the leader of opposition to demand that this government conducts a referendum prior to doing what it promised the people it will do before the election and on which the people have al already voted. I was wondering whether he was the same person that told the, the, the government of today when they were in opposition that they had lost the right to speak. I wonder if it's the same person who once told them that they had lost their right to advise. You see, Mr. Speaker, we need to stop attempting to fool the people. We need to stop taking them as tools to be used to get where we want to get. We want global no notoriety, we want power, and we use those people, unsuspecting people, when we get there, we forget who they are. You know, I looked at the group following the leader of the opposition, and that group shrinks on a daily basis. It's getting smaller and smaller every day. But you know, all of us, like him, when we do things like that to others, in our own quiet moment, you do some reflection, you do some internalization, and we question our consciences. To them I say that he will love you today, so as much as he could use you. But loyalty ends where the benefit stops. In this current context, Mr. Speaker, we need to take a brief look at our history and how far we have come as a country. For it was Bob Marley who once said that a man without knowledge of his history is like a tree without roots. As recent as a hundred, I heard my friend go way back to 1801 or thereabout. But as recent as 185 years ago, Mr. Speaker, our ancestors were slaves. Yes, they were slaves right here in this country. They were treated as property. The property of white slave owners, Mr. Speaker. Even as more recent as 71 years ago, the right to vote was confined to the few. You needed to have been of a certain color to vote. You needed to have had certain property to vote, Mr. Speaker. And this was kicked out of the window in 1952 
where universal adult suffrage was introduced into this country and every citizen from the age of 18 had the right to vote. This was the kind of treatment that was meted, us, meted out to us right here in this country. We probably don't know our great-grandfathers, but they were slaves. We probably do not know them when they, when they could not have voted, but there was a time when they could not have voted. That was the treatment, Mr. Speaker, that our ancestors were, were given in those days. And you know, Mr. Speaker, today, some of those audacious descendants of the white slave owners want to remind us of our sordid past. They want to rub it in our faces and look at us blatantly and say to us, colonialism had a conscience. That is what they remind us of, this, our slave past, that your grandfather and great-grandfather was the property of my great-grandfather. They remind us of that, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we moved from being slaves. We got promoted to being indentured servants. We needed property to vote or be of a certain color. And in 1952, after getting another promotion, we all acquired the right to vote. And from then, Mr. Speaker, our country was being run on autopilot until 1979. In 1979, this country got a further promotion, a further promotion to deliberate, regulate its own affairs right here in St. Lucia. But after 1979, Mr. Speaker, there were two strings, two strings of colonialism still attached to this country, that of our highest appellate court being lodged in London and our colonial head being a representative of the Queen. Today, Mr. Speaker, at this historic moment and sitting, we are severing ties with our colonial masters in yet another way, leaving one left, which I envisage that in the not too distant future, it will be placed on the cards and this great country of ours will no longer be represented by a colonial master. We have to be a republic in this country, Mr. Speaker. Let us completely, not partially, do away with our colonial past because colonialism had no conscience. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> one of the adages of the old adage of justice delayed is justice denied. It's not, it is true, but it is not the only way that leads to the denial of justice. Accessibility to justice may amount to a denial. Since the CCJ was formed in 2005, Mr. Speaker, only 18 cases, between 17 and 18, I'd rather say, have been heard by the Privy Council. That is about one case a year, as the Prime Minister indicated. But Mr. Speaker, we need to ask ourselves, what percentage of the totality of our cases is one case a year? What percentage does that represent? And although I don't have the empirical evidence before me, I can stay safe from a standpoint of knowledge as one who practiced at the bar that one case per year does not represent 1%. It does not represent 1%. It is below 1%, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the argument is over 99.9% .9 of our cases 
are settled within our locality. Over 99.99 cases are settled without having to resort to the Privy Council. They all are determined by local jurists. So if, Mr. Speaker, our local jurists are sufficiently redound to deal with such a great percentage of our cases, why can't they deal with all? What is the difference, Mr. Speaker? And further, further, it costs on average 130,000, one of my colleagues echoed that sentiment, over $130,000 for a litigant to access the Privy Council. And that is what we call colloquially referred to being represented by a LAPU lawyer. If you go for a top shelf lawyer, there is absolutely no way, Mr. Speaker, that your bill would be anything close to 130. It will be much higher, much higher. So, Mr. Speaker, there are those, like I said, who are, who are worried. What are they worried about? What are they worried about? Why should mistrust or distrust step in? When, as I said, over 99% of our cases are dealt with here. Less than 1% are decided by the Privy Council. Less than one percent. If we were to take a similar percentage, it would mean, Mr. Speaker, that less than one percent may be decided by the CCG. What are we worried about when all the other 99.9 percent .9 are decided by locally? So you know, Mr. Speaker, again, stupidity at its highest squid. Stupidity. And I'm hearing, let's march, let's march, let's march. You know, Mr. Speaker, even the Bible, even the Bible supports this move. Some may have known, some may not have known, Mr. Speaker. But I will ask you in your spare time to read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 to 20. And it is a biblical prophecy, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18, 18 to 20. Let me take the liberty of reading it right here, Mr. Speaker. It says, and I quote, Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord is giving you according to your tribes and they, they shall they shall represent the people with righteous judgment it is in the bible appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes according to your tribe and they shall give the people righteous judgment so in the bible mr speaker is asking us to appoint judges from amongst ourselves. Sadly, some people don't belong to ourselves, so they don't want us to appoint judges from ourselves. But it's not my fault, they are from different selves. It's no fault of mine, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> or different tribe. But you see, Mr. Speaker, you know, when they don't even understand what we as a government, what we are trying to achieve, we are actually bringing justice to them, to their doorsteps, making it cheaper, making it more accessible, and they tell you, no, marvelous. Les citlicien, les citlicien. Konu ye la ha cholma, ma siwe, adadi zot, te vle hai privy council. But se kalte la jan e ka pwo pou ale la. Ou ka jos di, ki te ke sa bat mize. O chay di zon ka di sa. A tcholma, nou vle ni si si je ya. Ko tout se ka sa vini a peyi a ko ou ka wete ya. Yo sa vini, 
si c'est cette ici, il y a un là, il y a un gaïna, il y a un tout. Yo satan nou ou sa wete kayou ou ka mete computer on yo ka wo ou ka pale ba yo et ou pa ka dépenser de, de des sous suivre qui ça qui primaire passer ça you know and you have a man asking some people who don't know any better to come and match come and match You know what? All of them should have had high court cases that need to go to the Privy Council, ask him to foot the bill. You know, Mr. Speaker, one of the rights that we as mankind should enjoy and appreciate is the right of human equality. Human equality. But sadly, We seemingly suffer from an inferiority complex. That is the harsh reality. When a man who said to us that colonial, colonialism has a conscience and is trying desperate, desperately sorry, to cause us to remain with our colonial past, with our colonial masters, one has no choice but to question his motive. Justice is now being brought to the doorstep of the reasonable man, the man on the Clapham omnibus, cheaply, quickly, and with a group of men and women whose credentials, credibility, and integrity we have been plastered with by the member from Viewfort South. The replacement of the Privy Council, Mr. Speaker, by our final appellate court, by the CCJ, sorry, could not be more timely. As we swim in the ocean of independence, we have been successful in taking care of ourselves and severing ourselves from our colonial past. As we sever one of the two remaining strings, As I said earlier, I look forward to the day when our colonial history will be something of the past. And like I said, Mr. Speaker, you know, in closing, let me just say this. On the St. Jude matter, we had four persons who sat in here as prime ministers or is still prime minister. Three went in one direction, one stood alone. <laughs> in this matter, Mr. Speaker, we have a recurrence of the very same thing. Three prime ministers are moving in one direction, but another wants to move in an opposite direction. You know... I now understand why the children always say, and the cheese stands alone. But there is no cheese. That C is not for cheese, Mr. Speaker. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Kenny Anthony, who spearheaded what we're doing today, and also to thank the Honorable Prime Minister, who in his budget address indicated that he will continue with that battle like I did with the battle really and bring the ship to shore. I want to thank you very much for that and I do know that the people of this country will feel the positive impact of very good stewardship as leaders of you both. Mr. Speaker, let me just say, let us keep shaping our destiny. Nous allons nous ensemble. Thank you.